Hello, uh, this is a recording of subject FIN 2601. Uh, I'm going to be looking at study unit three, uh, time value of money and introduction to that. And I'll also be looking at uh, some past exam questions I asked you to look at on financial ratios. So uh, in the previous class, uh, I gave you some questions to try as homework. Hopefully you were able to try those questions. I asked you to look at May, June 2018, question five to 13. Uh, May, June 2018, question five to 13. So I'm going to take you through these questions. And then when I'm done taking you through these questions, I'll introduce you to time value of money. So I'll start with question five from May, June 2018. <clears throat> question five said that um, uh, Queen B, Queen by, sorry, limited has net profit before taxes of 30 million and its tax rate is 40% of its earnings before tax. If the company has an interest expense of 6 million, what is the company's times interest end ratio? Now we know that the formula for the times interest end ratio is EBIT, also known as operating profit divided by interest expense. So you need to read the question carefully to see what you've been given. Sometimes they just give you these uh, items directly and you just divide, but sometimes they don't. They might start with net profit and then you have to add back tax and interest expense. Or as in this case, they might start with profit before tax. Then you just have to add back interest expense to get EBIT and then you can divide that EBIT by your interest expense. So in this case, we simply take our profit before tax, which is 30 million, and we add our interest expense, which is 6 million, and we get 36 million. And then we simply divide our <coughs> EBIT, earnings before interest and tax divided by interest expense. If they had given you a net profit, uh, if they had given you net profit, you would have to add back tax and interest expense. And remember that uh, in the previous class, um, I showed you how you would calculate interest expense. I'll just put that up on the screen. Sometimes you won't be given interest expense, sorry, how to calculate tax. I showed you how to calculate tax. And I said, if you want to calculate tax, you can use the following profit. Let's say you've been given your tax rate and your net profit is divided by one minus tax rate. But uh, in this case, we just had to get our profit. We had our profit before tax, so we just had to add interest expense and then we get the times interest end ratio. So the correct answer there is six, which is the option three. Remember that times interest and ratio is also known as the, as the uh, interest coverage ratio. Okay. And then the next question you had to do as questions is of 80,926. <clears throat> At year end, its trade and other payables were reported 482. What is the average payment period based on 365 days a year? Again, you start with your formula. Our average payment period is given by trade payable over annual credit purchases times 365. Sometimes they'll just say annual purchases, so you can just take it as annual purchases if they don't say that the purchase is on credit. So it's trade payable divided by annual purchases times 365. So it's simply 13,482 over 80,926 times 365, giving us 60.81 days. Okay. <clears throat> so the answer was option three. Then I also asked you to look at question seven. A legacy limited is a reported debt ratio of 80% and has total liabilities of 750,000 rand. If the company has no preference shared dividends and the net profit for the year amounts to 45,000 rand, what is the company's return on asset? What is the company's return on asset, right? <clears throat> so again, you always first uh, write out the formula for what you want to find. 
uh, return on assets is given by net profit minus preference here dividends over total assets times 100 percent you look at your question to see if you've been given this information then you just substitute you'll notice that from the question paper we've been given uh, the net profit we've been told uh, preference here dividends are zero there are no preference here dividends and we need to find total assets so that we can substitute them and we can get our answer now to get total assets um, we need to use the debt ratio we've been told that the debt ratio is 0 0.8 so debt ratio is equals to total liabilities over total assets we substitute our debt ratio total liabilities total assets we do some cross multiplication and division then we get total assets is equals to 750,000 divided by 0 0.8 which gives us 937,500. And then uh, we can then substitute our net profit minus zero. So it will just be 45,000 divided by the total assets times 100%, giving us a return on assets of 4.8%. So the correct answer there was option one. So most of the time in this module, the idea behind the financial calculations is that you are given a, a ratio to find and then one of the items is missing. Then you need to use information from another ratio to find whatever is missing and then you substitute it back and you get your answer. Next, we were asked to calculate the total asset turnover uh, for question eight. Wiley Limited has a return on assets of 8% and it has a profit before tax of 20 the company sales uh, were for asset turnover. Again, you start with the formula for the total asset turnover, sales divided by total assets. You look at your question to see if you've been given these items. We've been given the sales, but we haven't been given the total assets. So we need to use another ratio uh, to calculate total assets or some other information. So we've been given information on return on assets. So we substitute our net profit. Uh, we've been told return on assets is 8%. We do some cross multiplying and we get total assets is 270,000. Then we substitute um, the sales divided by the total assets which we obtained and we get two. So for question eight, the correct answer was option two. The same again applies for question nine. Maybe you could even pause and try this if you hadn't tried it already. But the idea is still the same. Morris Limited at current assets of 89,602, current liabilities of 36,125, and cost of goods sold of 77,538. If the company had an inventory turnover of 3.47, what would the company's quick ratio be? Again, to calculate our quick ratio, we use the following formula, current assets minus inventory over current liabilities. You check to see if you've been given this information. We've been given current assets and current liabilities, but we haven't been given inventory. So we need to use another ratio or some other information to get inventory. We use inventory turnover, uh, where we say inventory turnover 3.47 is equal to cost of goods sold over inventory. We do some cross multiplication and division. We get our inventory of 2234, 5.24. Then we substitute that into the quick ratio formula and we get 1.86. Okay. This is option two. <clears throat> question 10 and 11 were theory questions. So I'll take you through these two theory questions and then we'll look at 12 and 13, which are the last uh, questions I asked you to look at with calculations. Question 10 says, a company has a current ratio of one. What must the company do in order to improve its liquidity position? Number one says, improve its collection practices, thereby increasing cash and increasing its current and quick ratios. Number two, improve its collection practice and pay accounts payable, uh, thereby decreasing current liabilities and increasing the current and quick ratios. Option three, increase inventory thereby increasing current assets. 
uh, its current and quick ratios, and lastly, decrease current liabilities by utilizing more long-term debt, thereby increasing current and quick ratios. <coughs> right. Uh, the correct answer here uh, would be option one. Uh, practice this. Okay. Um, okay. Let, okay. Let's actually go through this. Um, I'm actually thinking I'd thought one before, but I think uh, the the correct answer yeah would probably be one. I think one would probably be the best answer because by the company improving its collection practices, it means that it's collecting <coughs> cash quicker, and by co collecting cash quicker, it increases its cash there by increasing its current and its quick ratio. So it means the company is selling goods quickly and collecting quickly. And then question 11, which of the following uh, would best explain a situation where the return on equity of a company is higher than the industry average, while the return on assets ratio is lower than the industry average? Um, now, to best answer uh, number 11, you need to remember that return on equity can be calculated using DuPont. So can return on assets. Return on assets can also be calculated using DuPont. Return on equity according to DuPont is total assets turnover multiplied by net profit margin multiplied by the financial leverage multiplier. And return on assets is total assets turnover multiplied by net profit margin. So if these two <coughs> are different from each other, if these two are different from each other, the most likely reason is that there's a difference in the financial leverage multiplier because that's what's present for return on equity and it's not present for return on assets. So if a company's return on equity and return on assets are different, it's most likely because of the financial leverage multiplier. So the correct answer here, why these two values would be different, we are asked which of the following would best explain why the return on equity of a company is higher than the industry average, while the return on assets ratio is lower than the industry average. <coughs> and this is the reason. The reason is uh, the company's debt ratio is higher than the industry average. And the reason, the reason is a higher debt ratio means more debt, giving us option one. So if the company has a higher debt ratio compared to the industry, it means that its return on equity will be higher. Its return on equity will be higher than the industry average, whereas its return on assets ratio will be lower than the industry average. <clears throat> so we would take option one. Okay. And then question 12, all melt limited financial statements show that the company has 27,894 profit after tax and 10,000 ordinary shares. If the company has a market price uh, per ordinary share of 8.75, what is the price to earnings ratio? Now, we know that the price to earnings ratio is given by market price over earnings per share. You check to see if you've been given this information. We were given the market price, but we were not given the earnings per share, so we need to calculate the earnings per share using the other information present. And we know that the earnings per share is given by the net profit minus the preference share dividends over the number of shares issued. So we get our earnings per share is 2.79. Then we say 8.75 divided by 2.79 giving us 3.14 as the price to earnings ratio. And that <coughs> is option four. And then lastly, uh, Lime Limited had preference share dividends of 182,000 and profit after taxes of 250,000. The company generated sales of 3.6 million. What is the company's net profit margin? Uh, again, the formula for the net profit margin is net profit minus preference share dividends over sales and 100%. You check to see if you've been given that information. All of it was given, so it's just a matter of substitution and then we get our answer. So in conclusion, when it comes to ratios, just make sure that 
you remember your formulas, uh, the different formulas of calculating the different ratios. And uh, also remember that sometimes when you have to calculate a ratio, there might be some information missing. So because some information is missing, <coughs> you might have to, to calculate whatever is missing using another ratio, and then you substitute it into whatever you want to calculate. So they can either ask questions uh, in the multiple choice section, like what I was going through, or they can ask a question in section B when they just want you to look at financial statements, then you calculate ratios and interpret whatever they've asked you to calculate. Okay. I can actually just put up um, an example of how else they could ask this. Uh, I think it was in 2018. It's not 2018, June. Let me just check just to give you an idea of what you might expect, yes, 2018. You can also get a ratio question coming in section B. For example, they can give you information like this. <clears throat> and then afterwards, they can ask you to calculate the current ratio, um, the quick ratio, inventory turnover, total asset turnover, debt ratio. They can ask you to calculate all these ratios. And then they can just say comment. So you should know which ratios fall under liquidity, which ones fall under activity, which ones fall under debt, which ones fall under profitability. Okay, so just make sure you memorize your formulas for ratios, become comfortable with, with your formulas because you need to remember them and also become comfortable <coughs> with how you might be asked to calculate a ratio where information is missing and then you have to get that information from another ratio and then you substitute it uh, so that you can calculate whatever needs to be calculated. Okay. So uh, I want us to continue. All right. So far, we've looked at um, financial statement analysis. I think we've touched that in detail. Maybe we'll just need to do a bit more revision closer to the exam. Remember, I told you to read on the role and environment of managerial finance. This usually comes in the exam with three or four questions. Just to illustrate at the beginning of the paper. They might ask maybe four questions. You see, usually it's just four marks. There are things you might even be familiar with from previous modules. Uh, but we'll look at that as we get closer to the exam. So you just need to read the pages I told you in the prescribed textbook. So we've looked at a financial statement analysis, even if you read the study guide on this, it should help. So I now want to introduce you to study unit three, which is the time value of money. Study unit three, the time value of money. Now, the idea behind the time value of money is that the value of money today is not the same as the value of money in the future. If you have a sum of money today, that sum of money is not worth the same today as it will be in the future. And the reason why the sum of money today isn't the same as the sum of money in the future <clears throat> is because of risk. Money in the future has a risk associated with it because you might not get it. You're not certain you don't have it yet. So that means the value of money today is the same as the value of money in the future. And inflation, <clears throat> money loses value with time, right? So if you have uh, money today, it won't be the same value as it will be in the future because its purchasing power will lose value. And other factors, like if you put money in the bank, you'll get interest. So the value of money in the future isn't the same as the value of money today. <clears throat> so there are various calculations we can do. There are various calculations we can do. Uh, we can use the financial calculator to do time value of money calculation. So in order to determine how much money is worth in the future because of interest rates and inflation, uh, we can do time value of money calculations even to get the present value if we invest money for a certain number of years and, and so forth. 
right? <clears throat> so I want to illustrate uh, to you the important functions on a financial calculator that you need to know about with regards to uh, time value of money, okay? <clears throat> Firstly, we have what we call FV. FV represents the future value, and you find it right at the top of your calculator there. Uh, PV, PV represents the present value, the, the value of money today, FV, the value of money in the future. N, N represents the number of intervals. This is usually in years. I over YR represents the interest rate. <coughs> PV represents the present value. And PMT represents the payment, usually the payment made annually. So these are the key inputs we'll be using. In the next class or the next video, I'll also show you how to use other functions. But for now, these are the important functions that you need to know. So PMT uh, represents a payment that's being made, usually a payment being made annually. It's not always annually, but usually it's annual. So this is the financial calculator uh, that we'll be using. I'll be showing you how to use this financial calculator. Okay. <clears throat> right. So just to show you how time value of money calculations are done, uh, let's look at a few examples. Uh, let's start by looking at question 11 from assignment one, semester one. Uh, question 11 from assignment one, semester one. Right? Uh, I'll put that question up. Question 11, semester this one. So the question says, you pl your parents will retire in 18 years, right? They currently have 250,000 rand in their investment account and they will need 1 million at retirement. What annual interest rates must they earn to reach their goal, assuming they don't save any additional funds? Okay, so your parents will retire in 18 years, they currently have 250,000 in their investment account and they will need 1 million at retirement. What interest rate must they earn to reach their goal, assuming they don't have any additional funds? <coughs> okay. So we can take that information. Uh, we can write it down. You need to identify everything. 18 is the number of years, that's N. 250,000 is what they invest, so that's PV. Please note, uh, when we're doing time value of money calculations, always put your PV as a negative. If you don't do this, your calculator might give you errors. FV is the future value, that's 1 million, that's how much they plan to have. And then we want to calculate the interest. So the calculator calculates this for us. So I'm going to show you how we would input this into our HP calculator. Okay. So here's our HP calculator. <coughs> right here. And I'm going to illustrate to you. So when you're using this HP calculator, right, uh, the first thing you need to do, you need to press the red shift button and see you need to press these two, and your calculator should be on one PYR. As you can see, this calculator is on 12 PYR, right? So because of that, it won't give me uh, accurate answers. The calculator should be on one PYR. So if it's not on one PYR, by default it's on 12, you press one to change it, and then you press the red shift button, then you press this PMT PYR button. So now it's fine, it's now on one PYR. So you press one, shift, and then PMT PYR. Okay, so now the calculator is fine. <coughs> and then you enter in uh, each of this information that you've been given. We've been told that 18, they want to invest for 18 years, 250,000 is our PV, uh, 1 million is our future value. So we punch in each item, then we press the button corresponding to it. Then we want the interest, which is 8.01%. Okay, so that's how um, I got my answer of 8.01. So the correct answer there 
would be option three, okay? But sometimes you have time value calculations in which we have payments happening every year, as you can see each year, or payments happening every, like every year, or every month, or every quarter. So sometimes you have uh, payments happening regularly. It's not just a PV, a once-off in investment, rather it's a regular investment after every time interval. <clears throat> so this is my own example to illustrate what you would do if you have payments happening each year or each interval. You invest 20,000 rand for eight years at the end of each year. If the interest rate is 10% compounded annually, determine how much interest how much the investment is worth after 10 years. So you're, depending to, you're depositing 20,000 rand each year for eight years at the end of each year, and the interest rate is 10%, and they want you to determine how much your investment is worth after 10 years. So eight is N, 20,000 is our PMT, we're investing this each year, 10% is our interest, and then our calculator gives us 228,717.76. I'll just show you that and put it into the calculator. I clear first. And then 8 is N, 20,000 PMT, 10 is my interest, and I press FB and I get my future value. Don't worry about the negative. The negative doesn't mean anything here. It's just the default setting on the calculator. Okay, so the answer would be 228717.76. But if you notice here, we said that the payments were occurring at the end of each year. Sometimes they can change the question slightly, like what I've put up. They might say that uh, you invest 20,000 rand each year for eight years but you are now investing at the beginning of each year. Okay, so it's now different. If the interest rate is 10%, determine how much the investment is worth after 10 years. <clears throat> so if you're now uh, depositing money or making payments at the beginning of each year, uh, you need to put your calculator into what we call the beginning mode. And then after putting the calculator into the beginning mode, you just repeat uh, the calculation exactly the way that I did it. So let me just illustrate that to you. As usual, we cancel our calculator. Uh, then we, uh, we press the red shift button. And then we press um, here for March for beginning end. Then we get beginning. So we've put the calculator in the beginning mode. Uh, then we say eight. 8 is N, we say 20,000, 20,000 is PMT, we say 10, 10 is our interest, and then we press FB and we get 251,589.54. So this is the answer that you will get. Remember, the minus doesn't mean anything. And remember, as soon as you're done with this, remove the beginning mode, okay? because you'll end up doing calculations incorrectly. You only put the beginning mode uh, if <clears throat> you are working with payments happening at the beginning of each year. And then lastly, uh, for today's recording, uh, time value calculations might, we also have time value calculations where payments are happening more than annually, or rather uh, time value calculations where compounding I think it would be better if I had said compounding here. Where compounding is happening more than annually. Uh, sometimes interest is being added uh, more than each year. So if you invest money in a bank, sometimes they give you interest monthly, every month or every six months or every quarter. So uh, interest might be made more than annually, right? So we might have interest uh, being compounded semi-annually or quarterly, or monthly, or daily, or weekly. If interest is being compounded in these intervals, we need to make adjustments uh, for N for the number of years. Semi-annually, we multiply our number of years by two, divided the interest by two. Quarterly, multiply by four, divide the interest by four. 
monthly multiply by 12, divide the interest by 12 daily, multiply by 365, divide the interest by 365 weekly, multiply by 52, divide the interest by 52. So these are some adjustments we need to make. Uh, let me illustrate this to you through an example. Uh, question 18, semester one, assignment one. Question 18, semester one, assignment one. Okay, there we go. Uh, the question says, you make monthly deposits of 75 rand into an account that pays 10% interest per annum, compounded monthly. You see that? This is what I was talking about. If you first if your first deposit will be one month from now, meaning you're depositing at the end of each month, how large will be your retirement? How large will your retirement be in 20 years? So we take our interest of 10% and we divide it by 12. Like what I said, we divide the interest by 12. We take 75 as our PMT. We take 20 years and we multiply by 12. Like I said, we multiply our number of years by 12. And then the calculator gives us the future value, right? Of 56,952.66. I'll just illustrate that to you using the financial calculator. We say 10 divided by 12. That's our interest. We say 75. That's our PMT. We say 20 multiplied by 12. That's N. And then we press FB and we get 56,952.66. Okay. So that's how we would do that calculation. But uh, something important, lastly, if you are actually calculating N or your interest and compounding is happening more than annually, you need to make opposite adjustments. Uh, you need to make opposite adjustments to these adjustments. In other words, if we are calculating the number of years and interest is being compounded annually, when we get N, we need to divide it by two. Or when we get N, we need to divide it by four. Rather, let me illustrate this to you through an example. It's better understood through an example. <clears throat> Let's look at question 14, semester one, assignment one. Question 14, semester one, assignment one. That's this question right here. This is a very good example. Uh, we're told one of your customers is delinquent on his trade payable and you have mutually agreed to a repayment schedule of 500 rand per month. So uh, your, they should pay 500 rand per month. You will charge them 1.3 interest per month. So they've already divided our interest by 12 to give us 1.3% interest per month on the overdue balance. If the current balance is 180,000 rand, how long will it take for the account to be paid off? So this PMT is monthly and the interest has already been given as a monthly interest rate, meaning they've already divided by 12 for us. So we are dealing with months here and this interest is monthly interest. And then we put in our PV of uh, 180,000 and remember we always put our PV as a negative. So the calculator will give us an answer of 48.86. But this 48.86 is not years, it's months, because we are making monthly payments and we're working with the monthly interest. So for us to get years, we need to divide by 12. We need to divide these months by 12 to give us the number of years, which is 4.07 years. So that's what I was talking about, about making opposite adjustments. You see, when we are inputting uh, years, we multiply. But if we are calculating years, if we get months, we need to divide by 12 to change the months to years. If we get quarters, we need to divide the quarters by, by four to change the quarters to years. If we get half years, semi-annually, we need to divide those half years by two to change them into years. The same applies with interest. If we had calculated the interest and we got an answer here, the answer we would have obtained for interest would have been a monthly interest. So we would need to multiply it by 12 to change it into a yearly interest, which is opposite to division when we are putting input. But we'll see more of this when we get to bond calculations. 
it can be tricky at first, but with time, if you think about what you've calculated, you are working with months, so we get an answer of months and then you change to years. With time, it will become easier as you practice more and more. Uh, so lastly, uh, I would like you to look at this homework, May, June 2019, question 18, 19, 20, 22, 25, and 26. These are just some time value of money calculations that I want you to look at as practice. And then I'll give you the solutions in the next class. Also, just for illustration, let me just show you how I actually did the calculation of 48.86, how I got that answer. Uh, I said 5,000 was my PMT, 1.3 was my interest, 180,000 as a negative was my PV, and then I pressed N. So these are months, then I divided these months by 12, and I got the years of 4.07 years. So remember, you always need to make adjustments. If you're dealing with months, it means the answer you're getting is in months and you need to change it into years and quarters and so forth. So please try these questions as homework. <coughs> uh, try to see if you can use your financial calculator to get these answers. And uh, I'll give you the the solutions in the next video when we finish off time value of money. If you have any queries with regards to what we were doing, please feel free to let me know. I might not always be able to respond promptly due to other commitments, but I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. I'm sure you have my number. If not, my number is up on the screen. Thank you very much.